Aloha, and welcome to Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies 25th Anniversary Celebration Webinar, Bridging the Past with the Future. My name is Elizabeth Kuntz, and I am a professor here at DKIA PCSS, and I am part of the team that helped put together this webinar that you are attending right now. We are here together to celebrate 25 years of bringing together civilian and military practitioners from across the Indo-Pacific and globe, as you can see from this video that just played. We come together to foster understanding, cooperation, and the study of security-related issues. The theme of today's webinar is Hindsight, Insight, and Foresight, celebrating a legacy to educate, connect, and empower. This two-hour session will be broken into three parts, featuring seven expert speakers who will discuss our region's collective achievements in the last 25 years, our current challenges, and imagine the future of security in the region across the next 25 years. The discussions that will be held over the next several hours have been largely shaped by feedback provided by you, our alumni in Ohana. The hindsight opening will broadly speak to our work over the last 25 years together. and will be provided by our director. The insight panel with panelists will broadly speak to the issues of strategic competition, free and open Indo-Pacific and global economic recovery. The foresight panel, the panelists will broadly speak to the coming security issues in the next 25 years and how together we will evolve, collaborate and adapt in order to strengthen our collective resiliencies to the challenges ahead. In the 50 engagements that we've had virtually since the COVID has pushed us all into this virtual environment, it is truly our core values that have held us together and kept the conversation going. That network, that experience that has built over the 25 years. And these core values of transparency, mutual respect and inclusion will be reflected in this webinar and will continue on. Thank you so much for dialing in today. We look forward to the next two hours and I'm going to hand over to my partner in crime, Ms. Sherilyn Kamahele. Aloha. This webinar today is being recorded. It will be posted on the DKI APCSS website and social media in a few days. Our disclaimer, the opinions expressed, are all our opinions expressed during our open and candid discussions do not reflect the official policy or position of DKI APCSS or anyone from the U.S. government. We welcome and value your comments and input throughout this webinar. To provide a comment, click on the chat as shown below, type your comment into the chat box, and click send. Our webinar will include your questions which you provided to us during the registration process. Therefore, any questions you type into the chat box will certainly be noted. However, it will be used as reference material for the composition of our executive report. I turn it back over to you, Dr. Coons. Thank you so much, Sherry Lynn. Uh, without further ado, let's start the uh, program, and I'd like to introduce my boss, director of APCSS, who became the director in February 2018 after 37 years of distinguished service in the United States Navy, retiring as Rear Admiral. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Beth, and thank you, Sherry Lynn, for the intro. And to everyone, aloha and a koma mai, which is welcome. So glad you could all join us. So this webinar marks the culmination of our 25th anniversary celebration, which actually started back in uh, May and July with two webinars on Indo-Pacific updates. And then just recently, last month on the 3rd of September, we had our third iteration of the DKI speaker series with the U.S. Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Mark Esper as our keynote speaker. And so finally today, with today's 25th anniversary webinar, as well as the launching of our 25th anniversary book, which I'll be talking about later on, we cap off a series of events focused on hindsight, insight, and foresight. And as we've shown in the past 24 years, DKI APCSS will continue to be a safe space 
for security dialogue and collaboration with all. But before I give my perspectives on hindsight, I would like to formally recognize upfront some key leaders, actually very special leaders attending our webinar today that were pivotal at the inception of our center. Joining us today, it's our distinct honor to recognize Admiral Mackey. Admiral Mackey lives here in Hawaii, but more importantly, he was the SYNCPAC commander at the time of the, uh, the opening of our center. And actually he was the leader who gave the direction, uh, working with other leaders such as Senator Inouye uh, to put together the uh, APCSS back then as they called it. Along with him, we have also joining us is General Bramlett. General Bramlett is also living here in Hawaii and a longtime supporter of APCSS, but he was also the deputy commander of SYNCPAC as well as chief of staff. And as you all know, the deputy commander and the chief of staff, they actually make all the things happening behind the scenes. So General Bramlett, it's good to have you as well, sir. We also have Ambassador Charlie Salmon, who was then SYNCPAC uh, uh, foreign policy advisor. And then later on, uh, joined us as a faculty member here at APCSS. So welcome, Charlie. Hope you're doing well. Last but not least, Dr. Jimmy Lackey. He is the first director of our center. Actually, he had the toughest job. He was given the direction with minimal steer to say, go build this center from ground up. And he had that vision, he had that courage, and he had the, uh, the uh, leadership to put together an awesome team. And I do wanna acknowledge a couple of plank owners that are here at our center still. Uh, Lenore Patton, who's uh, Sherry Lynn's boss and who's been with us since the beginning, as well as Mike Hogan. So with those folks, I just kind of warmly welcome them. I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, the APCSS Foundation led by Jerry Sumida. I know a lot of the foundation folks are up joining us, so welcome to you, as well as the DKI Institute led by Jennifer Sabas. Both these institutes, both these organizations have been always supportive through the years with DKI APCSS and their council, just their support and advocacy is really well appreciated. So we're honored that they're with us tonight. I also wanna give our six panelists our sincere mahalo nui loa. Thank you very much for giving us your time and insights during this upcoming webinar sessions. And specifically, I wanted to call out Professor Tim Buer who is actually a new acquired uh, professor here at APCSS. Uh, he has a lot of experience in the region. We look forward to his thoughts. Ms. Nadej Rolan, Mr. Kanehara no Nobokatsu, Lieutenant General Mike Minahan, who's the Deputy Commander of US Indo PACOM, Ambassador Amanda Ellis, and last but not least, uh, to round off our six panelists, is Ambassador Retired Scott Swift. Welcome to all of you and thank you again for, for joining us and being part of our panel. I also wanna give a warm aloha and a komomai to the newly appointed Defense Security Cooperation Agency Director, Ms. Heidi Grant. Uh, Ma'am, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, this afternoon, all the way from the East Coast. I know you guys are six hours ahead, so Thank you for coming up on the net. And I look forward to engaging with you in the future along with the DSCA team. Now, last but not least, I wanted to warmly welcome our alumni network. Many of you that came up a little bit early before our start time saw the awesome greetings and shout outs by our alumni. That's just the tip of the iceberg of folks that have supported us, worked with us and been there be the advocate themselves for building a secure and stable environment. And we also have some former APCSS faculty and staff and so many colleagues out there that have worked with us through the years. So welcome to all of you. In addition to our own APCSS Ohana staff and faculty that are up joining us, I just wanna let you know that there are nearly over 200 external residents to include 30 nations plus Taiwan joining us today. I also wanted to give a special mahalo to the alumni who provided us some input and feedback 
to shape today's discussions. So a little bit about hindsight. I thought about this in terms of 25 years, and I think for over two decades, Senator Inouye, along with other leaders that I've mentioned earlier, had this vision. And with everything that happens that's great, you always have to start with the vision. They had this vision of establishing a center here in Hawaii, where civilian and military leaders can come together and just set aside their differences and talk. And as Senator Inouye said in an audio recording we have, that can maybe even argue at times, but do it respectfully, transparently, in order to do what? To come away with the mutual understanding of this very complex security environment. And more importantly, with that mutual understanding, come away with mutual solutions. I think this vision was so important and it was actually codified in the founding mission of the center, which is simply to foster understanding, cooperation, and study of security related issues among military and civilian representatives of the United States and other Asia Pacific nations. In hindsight, I believe looking back 25 years, our center has done its due diligence to facilitate and witness the realization of this mission. The countless achievements across a very diverse region working closely with over 14,000 alumni is a powerful statement of what can be accomplished working together to better understand and come away with mutual solutions. As we stand here today, now more than ever, I believe there is this need for collective dialogue and cooperation so that we can help solve the challenges that we face today, not just us, but with future generations that we face in this very complex security environment. I believe everyone participating in today's webinar understands this saying, it's worth repeating, that if you want to go fast, go it alone. But if you want to go far, do it as a team. The 21st century is being touted as the Asia Pacific century. What this simply is saying is that the future bodes well if you live or work in the Indo-Pacific, a future trend of growth and prosperity in a stable and a secure environment. But ladies and gentlemen, there is a catch. I believe we will only realize our potential as a region if we continue to work with transparency, mutual respect, and inclusiveness with each other's diverse views. I do believe that the complexity of the challenges ahead will call upon the collective effort of everyone. It's a whole of society approach to better understand and work together through differences to ensure that we have a stable and free and open environment that does lead to the prosperity that we are being touted to receive here in the next century. So I look forward to the comments of our two sessions, looking at insight and foresight to help generate the critical thinking needed to foster mutual understanding, building relationships and trust needed to get to these mutual solutions and to help us realize our full potential. And so with that, thank you again so much for joining us in this afternoon's webinar session. And I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. John Hemmings, who will be leading uh, our first panel regarding um, a foresight or insight, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Hemmings. Thank you very much, Director. And it's a real pleasure to be here uh, moderating what I think is, is a, a wonderful panel that will take us into our, our first panel to look at the insight of the region and what's happening in the region now and how can our, our uh, attendees think about it, how can they analyze it and how can they uh, create good policy to respond to it. We have three wonderful speakers who are gonna take us through a kind of 
interesting buffet of economics, uh, national, you know, strategic competition, and of course, uh, principles and uh, open strategy. And along with us today, just to briefly introduce to you, we have, of course, our own professor, Dr. Timothy Buer, who has just joined us to, uh, for a month. He has been in the region uh, working on US ASEAN uh, aid and trade issues for more than 18 years, and he comes with a huge background and expertise in economics. We have uh, to follow that. He will talk about uh, economics and how we're dealing with the COVID uh, downturn. This comes right after uh, news of a World Bank report on, on the poverty that's being created by the COVID disease. So we're looking forward to his remarks, following him speaking on strategic competition and the rise of China will be uh, Ms. Nadej Rolan, who is a senior fellow for political and security affairs at the National Bureau for Asian Research. Um, Ms. Rolan has been a diplomat for the French Ministry of Defense for many, many years. She's long been an expert on Chinese foreign and defense policy. Uh, and frankly, I've been reading her work um, with some uh, interest for a number of years. She also uh, was at the uh, S. Rajat Ratnam School of International Relations. And so she also has uh, extensive regional experience. And then finally, of course, uh, coming back to us, uh, our alumni from 2002, as far back in, as then, our, our various illustrious uh, Kanehara Nobukatsu, who of course is a professor at Doshisha Daigaku or Doshisha University, and people who I'm sure who are aware of uh, Kanehara, his academic credentials, as impressive as they are, are nothing compared to his time in government. He spent uh, nearly seven years as the Assistant Chief Cabinet Secretary to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. He was also the inaugural Deputy Secretary General of their National Security Secretariat. And previously to his time in, in the Cabinet and Research Office, he was actually in, in uh, MOFA, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I knew him uh, at that time as the Deputy Director General of European Affairs. So without further ado, we're going to get right into it so that you can uh, have, a, have a listen. I'm going to ask uh, each panelist as they come on to turn on their microphone. Timothy Bure, if you would please turn on your microphone and your camera. Uh, and you have seven minutes, sir, and I will come back on screen when you have one minute to go. And with that, the floor is yours, sir. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, John. I've been asked to talk to you about economic recovery after COVID, but as best I can tell, there's not going to be an after COVID. All indications are that COVID will be with us for the long run. We need to be planning for economic recovery during COVID, albeit with the vaccine and better treatments. To think about recovery, we must first understand the past and the trends that got us here uh, to this highly interconnected world of 2019 and set the stage for the recession that we are now in. I see five critical economic trends that made this, our network world possible. <clears throat> First, logistics and transportation costs declined significantly over the last 50 years, which made it easier for goods and people to move around the world. Second, trade barriers like tariffs and quotas were systematically reduced and rules of trade were codified, at least in part, which gave business greater certainty in their trade relationships. Third, IT and communications technologies gave companies a strong ability to manage a wide range of suppliers, both domestically and internationally. Fourth, and related to the first trend, the cost of international travel fell dramatically while it became far simpler. Finally, the global digital economy was created and was disrupting traditional business models. So what are the implications of these trends? First, companies were driven by competition um, to adopt lean supply chains that drove down costs and, and prices while spreading manufacturing around the world, leading to an 11-fold increase in real exports with trade rising by 45% to 45% of GDP globally. Developing countries benefited significantly from this, uh, particularly China, as low-cost labor and cheap capital made it the manufacturing hub of the world. Countries like the United States benefited from cheaper goods and more jobs and services and design to you, you make use of factory China. But this also created tensions um, as the costs and benefits were not spread evenly. Cheap and convenient international travel led to an explosion of tourism that would have been unimaginable 50 years ago. 
countries like Thailand and many of the Pacific Island nations states benefited greatly from this trend, as did Hawaii. In 2019, international tourism was worth about $1.5 trillion. At the same time, there was an enormous expansion of temporary migration for employment that led to rapid growth in remittances in developing economies like Nepal and the Philippines. Global remittances um, <clears throat> exceeded $550 billion in 2019. And for countries like Nepal, they were almost 30% of GDP as a significant factor for many countries. Five trends that I've mentioned in their applications resulted in a tightly networked world, reducing poverty and creating great wealth. And then COVID happened. And the benefits are our interconnected and networked world came back to haunt us. The impact of the pandemic, as we have seen, has been huge. A global recession of magnitude not seen since the Great Depression. Global GDP is predicted predicted to fall by over 5%. Global trade has fallen 14%. Global remittances are expected to fall 20% and international travel has basically stopped. Countries did not have high, that even countries that did not have high COVID rates or stay at home orders have had their economy impacted by the pandemic. This suggests that a global recovery is critical to national recovery and response. It's also important to note that much of the decrease in economic activity was being driven by consumers slowing their purchases. While this is partly driven by government decisions like stay at home orders, it was significantly driven by cautionary actions of consumers who are changing their own behavior. I dwell on this because we need to remember that the economy will not improve until we have the pandemic under control. An effective vaccine will help, but not right away. Even if we technically have one in let's say December, why global coverage is probably a year or more away. So if you're interested in more facts and figures, I refer you all to the uh, document that John mentioned in the introduction, which is the New World Bank uh, report, uh, East Asia and Pacific Economic Update for October, which covers the pandemic and possibilities for recovery in far, far greater detail than I can do in seven minutes. So what are the key policy recommendations for economic recovery in this network COVID world? First and foremost, countries must address the public health emergency. Families will only go out to eat or take an international vacation when they feel safe. Workers will only be productive if they think their workplaces are safe. Finding the right mix of policies will be national, maybe even a local issue. Masks and physical, uh, physical distancing are likely part of a solution anywhere where infection rates are high and before, uh, the end, before there's a vaccine that is administered to a large portion of the population. Countries like Vietnam and New Zealand have been successful in avoiding the worst uh, of the pandemic and the U.S. is not. We need to be looking to the lessons um, from the various countries and applying them around the world. So once we've dealt with the, once we've dealt with the pandemic or once those policies are in place, what can we do? Well, I think first, social protection programs are really important. Uh, people who have lost jobs and businesses need help from the government. They need to, the government needs to spend. With low interest rates, resulting deficit spending is not a huge issue. And it's critical to avoid significant problems in unemployment, poverty, and in less developed countries, hunger. This is a problem for countries. Th this will be, though, a problem for countries with limited financial resources. And I'll touch upon this when I talk about global actions. Second, keep interest rates low. This helps both consumers and businesses. Third, improve the legal and regulatory environment for businesses in ways that support forward looking industries, not backward facing ones. Digital economy is growing rapidly. And we should find ways to encourage that. And then international, those are national policies. International coordination is critical. At the global level, we need to expand debt, the debt payment moratoria and consider debt forgiveness for hard hit poor countries. They're gonna need financial help and we need to find out ways to do that. Okay, I've got my one minute. Keep an eye on um, food security. Coordinate monetary policies to ensure stability and exchange rates while taking steps to ensure global liquidity. Avoid beggar thy neighbor policies that may provide initial relief to local economies, but lower global prices, er, low, low, uh, lower global growth prospects, which means getting our supply chains back in action. Implement mechanisms to increase growth of global trade, and then global economic pandemic preparedness needs to be upgraded. In summary, I hope you'll take three ideas away. One, we need to address the pandemic health emergency today. Two, we need to put in place policies to encourage global growth 
uh, and production, including international supply chains. And three, we need to put in place policies to continue the expansion of the global digital economy. And just to put in one sentence about security, we need to focus on pandemic preparedness as a security issue, and we need to, to have a, a, an enhanced focus on the, securing the digital trading system. Thank you. Back to you, John. Thank you so much, um, Tim. That was really wonderful. And, and certainly you gave us a lot to chew on, um, particularly in, in terms of thinking about the digital economy. That's something that I think all of us are going to be uh, thinking about in coming years. Um, I think I'll now ask you to switch off your screen and your microphone. And if I may, um, Ms. Nadezhda Roland, if you would please turn on your microphone and screen. And uh, you have uh, seven minutes as for our read time, and the floor is yours. Thank you, John. It's an, it's an honor and a pleasure to participate in today's virtual discussion. I wish it would be in Hawaii, but alas, maybe next year or in five years for the 30th anniversary. I, I want to start with wishing a happy 25th anniversary to the uh, TKI APSS. Um, in 25 years, the world has gone through tremendous transformations and in particular, has seen the emergence of China as a rising power and as a potential competitor to the US leadership. For many of those 25 years, Western governments have assumed that China would naturally join and support the international system, its institutions, and the values and norms that underpin them. But especially since uh, Xi Jinping's accession to power in late 2012, the Chinese leadership has given clearer indications that China does not only want to enjoy a central position on the global stage, uh, commensurate with its uh, material power, economic, political, diplomatic, and military, but also to, to reshape, to alter, to redefine elements of the existing system in order to uh, benefit its own views and its own interests. Beijing now openly complains about how the current international order is dominated by the West, uh, whereas its own position is one of subordination, and it would like to see the roles reversed. China's ruling party also considers the existing system as rooted in ideals um, such as universal values and democratic principles, that it claims have not brought prosperity and peace for the rest of the world and would certainly endanger its own legitimacy and perhaps even its own survival. So now Beijing feels entitled to seek change uh, on the basis of its growing relative power and of its own domestic achievements. But what exactly would be its substitute for the existing system and for the norms that currently underpin it? And what does China have to offer as a replacement for the elements of the existing system that it rejects? This is much less clear. But if we pay careful attention, we can see some elements emerging. And rather than what sometimes people think China is up to, Rather than envisioning a complete overthrow of the current system, Beijing favors a two-pronged approach. It wants to shape the existing system from within by weakening its most challenging elements, while at the same time carving out some space over which China will be able to exert more control. And within the existing system, uh, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, exploits and subverts uh, institutions and organizations in order to uh, turn them to its own purposes and, serves it and, and to serve its interests. In parallel, it attempts to weaken and discredit ideas and norms that are threatening to its legitimacy, uh, denying in particular the universality of uh, what it calls so-called universal values. Um, the Chinese leadership believes in the power to influence the behavior of others uh, by shaping language, concepts, formulations, and ideas. This is what they call discourse power. 
in addition to this other mat material powers. Um, in addition to maneuvering within the existing institutions, the Chinese leadership is envisioning the creation of what looks like a sphere of influence uh, where China would be the most powerful country, would sit at the top of a hierarchical structure in which other smaller and weaker countries would respect the primacy of Beijing's authority and interests. Uh, this articulation or the, the creation of this subsystem where China would be the predominant power is not fully developed yet. It's a work in progress. Uh, uh, but there are some indications that this is what the leadership would want to tend uh, towards. Um, the existing discussions uh, that are going on uh, in China point to um, a form of uh, hegemony, even if the Chinese leadership doesn't like to use this word when it's related to China, it prefers to use this word when it's related to the US and the West in general. A form of hegemony that would be very different from the past Western models. <clears throat> and I, I call it a partial, loose and malleable hegemony. Um, it's a partial um, a, a ex exercise of power, not, not a global one. You know, China doesn't necessarily want to rule over the world, but certainly over portions of it, geographical portions of it. Uh, I call it loose because I, I don't see um, an effort to directly exert control over territories or governments and malleable because it's not necessarily geographically or ideologically limited. The people or countries that would be included um, are not necessarily inside of Asia. Uh, and the best way to have the mental map of what this could cover is the Belt and Road. The Belt and Road Initiative is the spine or the backbone of this new order. As for us in the West, we're starting to realize that rather than being socialized within the existing institutions, China has managed to win, to win a great degree of influence and even to bring a number of them under its control. Uh, we have yet to fully acknowledge and understand the significance of discourse power and how China uses it to serve its objectives. And finally, I think we're behind in realizing the significance in uh, their thinking of the developing and emerging world. Uh, the US-China competition does not just take place among the two powers exclusively across the Pacific, I think that for Beijing, the developing and emerging world is a crucial space in which the competition is also playing out and it has started a while ago. With that, I will stop. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much for keeping time, um, Ms. Roland. So uh, without further ado, uh, we now uh, move to our third panelist, uh, Kanehara Nobukatsu. Sir, if you would please turn on your screen and your microphone. And I believe you will be speaking to us about the free and open Indo-Pacific and talking to us about strategy. I see your mic is off, but we do not see you yet. Uh, the video is muted by, your, by, by host. Oh, it's coming in. Uh, oh. Sir, the floor is yours. Yeah. Well, thank you, John. Thank, thank you, John. And happy 25th anniversary and I'm an alumni, happy to be back here. I'll make some, some points. And the first one is the liberal international order is now coming to Asia. It's expanding from Europe, the new continents, and finally to Asia, the beating heart of 21st century economy. And this started quite recently, 1980s, we saw Korea, and Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan just started to jump out from the developing phase, and they are now very big industrial democracies. And the, at the same time, we sometimes do not pay big attention to this, but the other side of this development was the democratization. In the, in the Philippines, democratization happened in a dramatic way, 1986. 
And then we saw in Seoul, Korea, they, the dictatorship by the military fell and they established a robust democracy in 1987. And then Li Danfei, Taiwan, he is Kuomintang man, but he is born in Taiwan. And he said democracy in Taiwan was successful. That's, he's a father of Taiwan democracy. ASEAN nations followed. There are many uh, shaky democracies, but they are very proud democracies, and they have problems inside still. But our democracies had big, democr big, big problems before. They are going to overcome it, and we have to engage them as an equal partner to build this liberal international order in Asia. The biggest challenge is, of course, China. Hu uh, Yaobao in Chinese Communist Party was talking to our Prime Minister Nakasone, it's before Tiananmen, and he was talking about democracy. China has not yet decided the course to follow us, become like us, or go some very different direction. And Tiananmen was a uh, watershed. They shut the door against the, against the democracy, but they opened the door for the Western economy. That's a choice of China and then Xiaoping. And they were successful in industrialization. And they developed as a huge dragon now. It's no longer a lovely panda. It's a huge dragon running in the sky. That's today's China. They are now three times bigger than us in terms of economy, four times bigger than Japan in terms of military budget. Our military budget is the same size as UK, France, Germany. That means with these four big nations' military budgets combined, it's smaller than Chinese military budgets. Just like truly uh, Jack's bean tree, they became very big very quickly. And still many don't understand how big China is today. Problem is that they don't share our liberal history. China said, you know, the, this world is dominated by the West, by the Europeans, Americans, maybe more than Japanese. It's not true. It's over. In before 1945, the world was divided into two parts, colonial powers and the colonized people. And it's over. The independence of Asian African nations happens in 1950s, 60s, and the racial discrimination as institution was abolished by Reverend King, Mandela, Gandhi, if you go back more, Lincoln, Garrison, Tolstoy, now it's over. This is liberal order. A liberal order is for everybody. It respects the absolute equality of people's conscience and people's dignity. This is no longer the West versus East. This is no longer Europe, Americans versus Asia. This is one liberal order. And China has a permanent city in the United Nations. China's inside WTO. They have nothing to complain about. We wish very much that they should come back, but the difficulty is after they shut the door for democracy in Tiananmen, they started to replace communism by patriotism to give legitimacy to CCP. Uh, it's, it's dangerous because too much injection of patriotism, history issue, can be toxic. That somehow we experienced. It's a bad experience. And the many 100,000 ethnic minorities, now they are, they are, they are, they are called to be Han China with 5,000 years history. And they, then shall be made many museums of say Nanjing, Marco Polo Bridge, Opium War. And this is a bit dangerous. Uh, they should come back to the West. To engage China, the West must be united. Otherwise, nobody can engage China any longer. China is like Nadej said, China is like Byzantium. They are agents of God, so there's no border. And they are, everybody's vassals, as far as they are enlightened by China, and they have to accept China's leadership. 
And China is a regional hegemon, not a global hegemon, but China was in that way. So we have to engage China. For that purpose, we have to be united. One, the Quad is very important. U.S. commitments, without it, Asia is going to be lost. But we need Australia, and we have to engage India, 10 years younger than China population. We are 10 years senior. And with this big strategic framework, of course, we need European contribution. And then we have to engage ASEAN new democracies. We have to build. And TTP is important again. This should be reconstructed in Washington, not from the commercial perspective, but from the strategic perspective. Then we can ask China to stay course and engage China from the position of strength and they do not listen to the weak. This is my presentation. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Kanehara-san, that was superb, complex, nuanced, and exactly, I think, hit the, the button right. Can I ask our other two speakers, Nadesh and, and Tim, to please turn on their screens and their microphones? I'm super grateful to this panel. Um, it's kind of a com it's you know it's a difficult ask. Here we are going through COVID nineteen. Um, people at home have experienced huge change in their life this year. You know we're looking back twenty five years from now to when DKI APCSS began, and our operating environment has changed fundamentally. Um, but I think all of you try to approach it from you know a way that also allows for us to keep doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is to seek engagement, to try to uh, change for a better world, for a better region. I'm now going to, um, and so I'm very grateful to you for setting us up for a good uh, conversation. As you know, as I briefed you before, we're gonna move pretty swiftly. We have some questions lined up for you. Um, I will tell Timothy your question, and then I will also tell, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Roland's question and Mr. Mr. Hara's question so they can think about it while you're answering yours, Timothy. So, Timothy, you spoke to us about the, envir the economic environment in the region and, and how we're facing uh, uh, quite a, a, a sticky situation. I also read the World Bank report, thanks to you sending it to me. It was very helpful and, and thought provoking. I wanted to ask you, you know, how do we and how do, how do our panelists, our regional panelists, how do we deal with the tension that confronts us between dealing with supply chain vulnerability on the one hand, and, and this speaks directly to our dependency on, on China, for example, on rare earth metals or uh, personal protection uh, equipment, as we discovered. How do we deal with that, that need for supply chain security, but also the need to rebuild our economies quickly, which really, you know, we rely on China as a great trade partner. So, Timothy, that's your question. Um, Ms. Roland, my question for you is, what, what's driving, so far as we can say, what is driving the PRC's push uh, in this kind of expansion into the world under Xi Jinping? Um, you know, how, how, what does China want and how can we, you know, is it possible to shape China's behavior? This has always been, I think, for China hands, the, the hundred billion dollar question. Um, and in fact, Kanehara and San and I, we, we've talked about this previously in the past, you know, shaping China's behavior. It's that great riddle that the West has constantly asked itself. But uh, Southeast Asia also asks it. So if you would think about that, and then Kanehara-san, sir, I would ask of you to think about this while Timothy's answering. You know, Japan has played a, a really interesting uh, and, and fundamentally almost revolutionary role in, in developing the Indo-Pacific framework and concept. And I know, sir, in fact, you are personally, uh, you, you've played a, a substantive role in that uh, intellectual contribution. What has driven uh, uh, Japan in doing that? And, and what does it mean for the region? And what does, you know, you've seen other states respond to the framework fairly positively. Some have hedged, but many have taken up the actual language, um, you know, just to name a few, Indonesia with the, the ASEAN outline, uh, Vietnam, I think, mentions it, the 
Indian Ministry of External Affairs uses it in their uh, department now, and of course, Australia, United States. So th those are your questions, and um, we'll, we'll move pretty swiftly. I think we have a uh, panel stop at uh, 3.01, uh, so I would ask that you keep your questions reasonable, like two, maybe three minutes, and then hopefully we can get another second round of questions in. Timothy, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you very much, John. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, and you know, the bottom line is that the bottom line is we are tied to these value chains today. I mean, there's there's just really no getting around it. If we want to have if we want to have a quick recovery, we need for these for existing value chains to be to be reinvigorated at least in the short term. But that doesn't mean that we're stuck with them in the longer term, and it doesn't mean that we can't continue the kinds of trends that were actually happening pre-COVID. I mean, this isn't a COVID issue. This has been a, you know, a competition issue for quite some time, and it is one of, um, of importance to both the governments of the region and to the private sector of the region. I mean, we have seen a lot of uh, movement out of China by the private sector even before it became uh, you know, good, good policy on everyone's part, in part because China is becoming more expensive, but big part, part because diversification is important. So I think the, the key here is recognize, the, recognize that we need these value chains and supply chains to be functional today, but keep the pressure on to diversify into the future, which means as the World Bank report, I think you, put, you read in the World Bank report that the countries, particularly the region, the developing countries need to put in enabling policies that will allow that kind of change in supply chains to happen. So thanks very much. I think that's my response to your question. Thank you so much. Um, Nadesh? Yeah, um, thank you for throwing softballs at me. <laughs> you know, those, those questions are, are really, uh, what is driving China's push in its expansion? Um, well, it's, uh, it's both the accumulation of this material power, it's both the expansion of its uh, national interest, its global commercial and economic interest, um, uh, its footprint is now everywhere in the world, um, which for now hasn't been accompanied by a military or security footprint as of yet, but it might evolve very rapidly in this, in this direction as there is more and more uh, need to protect um, both Chinese citizens and assets, especially along the Belt and Road. Um, there are domestic elements really that are also, um, that can explain this push uh, to shape and reshape the, the, the narrative and the, and, the, and, the, and the international order as it, as it is, because the CCP as a one party state um, feels threatened by um, values of democracy. Um, they think that, um, uh, many of the things that the West is doing through engagement is meant to peaceful evolution, to color revolutions in other ways, to, in other words, to the demise of, of its political system. And so China for a while was defending itself at home against what those perceived threats, but now it's trying to reshape the environment in ways that are more favorable to authoritarianism in general. Um, is it possible to shape China's behavior? I think the policy of engagement that we have seen for the last 40 years was, is, was exactly uh, meant to do that, to include it um, into uh, the liberal international order that uh, kanehara san talked about at length, um, and to, by including it into the system, trying to transform it uh, into a more liberal power. Uh, this has not happened. Uh, so now the question is whether the policy of engagement is still relevant as China's power has uh, increased significantly and it has not liberalized at the same time. So this is, this is the question whether uh, it's possible to shape its behavior. I think, it, I think it's possible to shape its policies uh, in a way. Uh, but this, I agree with Kanehara san that this might take all of us uh, and that we cannot just act in, in separation from our partners and allies, including in Asia and Europe, to be able to do that together. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. 
Mr. Kanehara san, how about yeah. in terms of the Indo Pacific? Yeah, thank you very much. Our strategic thinking is just to, to, to cope with Chinese rise simply. It is too big today, and suddenly too big. We have to think of something. We don't have NATO here. We don't have, and we don't have the EU here. We are alone to face Chinese and Russians together. Um, Korea is a bit today a bit strategically confused. Uh, Australia is a good friend, but far away on the other side of the Ecuador. And we have to engage them, of course. And we need India, the next superpower, to make a strategic stability in the region. This is the first. And I have said this is the beginning. China is going to grow even under new normalcy. It's a huge nation, and, but it will pick out. We are just following our path, industrialization, nation state built, building, national, national army, and then democratization in the end. It happens, it's a necessity, because people are simply awakened. But we have to wait maybe two decades before that, before China gets matured. They have 20 years more to go. In the meantime, they become very big and could be naughty. And they say 5,000 years history, but just like 15 years old boy, they don't listen to us. But we can't depend upon their goodwill to change. We can't talk to them, but with some might, it's necessary. Uh, it's delicate, but we have to do it. And the second one is so the strategic stability. Second reason is economic integration of the region. The TPP is a very good step forward, strategically, but commercially too. We cannot let China spread their Beijing consensus. We have to have a true free trade system here. First time Japan took initiative, simply because since 1985, Japan's yen was triply if appreciated by Plaza Accord. We became no longer, we became no longer exporter, we became investor. We need free market functioning everywhere so that our investors can make profits. And this is our national interests and we have to do it. China is doing some one road, one way, one road. It's star like China center and all the like pipeline. It's like Russian, Russian pipeline system. China is the center. What we're doing is connecting everywhere like matrix. Because we want a free market itself a big one, and the promotes regional economic integrations with good connectivities. That's our strategy today. The second reason why we're pushing this. Third one, this is values. 50, 150 years of experience of Western democracy. Our parliament opened 1890. It's very early, isn't it? 1890, we had elections. 1889, we had constitutions. It's 15 years earlier than Russians. And we made some mistakes, big ones, but the, finally, Japanese thought, this is the same thing that we believed. The government is not for uh, the king, the government is for the people. But this is Confucius, and we knew this. The people is absolutely equal. The skin color is not important at all. Your conscience, your soul, you listen to your heart, the truth, this comes from God. This is love. And this is the same thing. So liberal order is truly universal. That's the reason why we're pushing this idea forward, free and open in the Pacific. Dan. Thank you, all of you. We have until 3.02, so I'm going to throw another round of questions at you, and then I'll ask you to make uh, uh, one-minute concluding remarks. I, I think... Um, We'll go the opposite direction. So I'll go back to you, Kanehara, then to Nadej, and then to Tim. So Kanehara-san, you know, quite interesting that you mentioned, you know, norms and values. You mentioned the economic integration, and you you mentioned the, the lack of that regional security architecture. So this is something that ASEAN has uh, struggled to do with the ASEAN Regional Forum, um, and you know, there's a real push and pull uh, in terms of where we were 25 years ago, people saying, you know, actually ASEAN has done quite a lot to put in um, various uh, forum for dealing with security in a consultative way, while others have maintained that actually the alliance system, the US system, and 
its development uh, into the trilateral and quadrilateral has also um, helped. Where do you see the security architecture of the Indo-Pacific going in the future? I know that's a tough one and, and perhaps a little bit reserved for foresight, but um, just because we have your brain on the panel and you, are, you have been thinking about these issues for so many decades, I'm curious, what do we see in the regional architecture now that we think we can see in the future? Yeah, can, can I start or wait for yes, it? Yes, Yes. Yeah, there are some levels here. The Europeans have OSC, NATO, EU, and they have all these different institutions interacting together. It's the same thing here. ASEAN was a great success for multilateralism. Just compare that with Central Asia. It's very different. It's true democracy there. One, one nation, one votes. Laos, Indonesia, the same weights in voting, the consensus making. And this is a good OSC type organization. They invite big ones, Russians, Japanese, and Chinese, and Americans. This is good for multilateralism and good for understanding each other. Maybe we could talk about human rights if, if, we, if we could. The strategic balance is very different. It's just like NATO. And you have to think of that. The military credible powers are limited. And you have to gather these people. This is the basis of the multilateralism. This part is hardware. Then we need the quad. And some members of ASEAN could be interested, but we cannot engage whole ASEAN because uh, there are some nations who speak for, of course, China. And it is not easy to engage whole ASEAN uh, as an organization. So for the strategic things, military things with the quads, we have to talk to the interested nations in this. And finally, I have to say, the real strategic counterweight to rising China is only rising India. So we have to engage them. They are not yet, uh, they are not yet superpower. And China is becoming superpower, but in say 10 years time, they'll take off. China's average age is now 40 years old. Japan is 50 years old, amazing, isn't it? Americans are 40 years old and Indians are 30 years old. The future is theirs. Thank you so much, sir. Um, Nadesh, if I may um, push to you next and then we'll go to Timothy. Um, my question with you is perhaps a variation of the previous question. I apologize for that. Um, one of the things that you threw back at me is that these riddles are, are pretty difficult to solve. So I'm gonna to try to drill down a bit further into it. One of the things that we note with China in terms of the strategic competition with the United States, but also with other powers in the region, including Japan, including India, Australia, is its preference for bilateralism because of its size, its asymmetry. And you see this with its economic diplomacy, um, diplomacy within the BRI. It, it has these multilateral forums, but it tends to sign contracts bilaterally. Do you think that, you know, one of the things that perhaps the region might begin to adapt to in order to the next step of trying to sway uh, a more powerful, a more confident China is this sort of collective approaches that you mentioned briefly in your previous response. So what's interesting, I think in, in um, this competition of, for me, it's a competition of models uh, between China and the US or the West, um, more and more so. And I think that China has been more vocal or through its leaders in saying it this way um, until Xi Jinping did, didn't really say it. Um, in this competition of models, you also have um, uh, structures or um, visions that are mirror imaging and others that are completely different. And in that sense, um, the US is good at organizing institutions and alliances uh, where everybody else is equal, basically. Uh, China prefers to be the dominant power while others are uh, subservient or weaker powers and more dispersed. Where the US wants um, an alliance of, uh, with, with partners 
um, in a group, China wants not necessarily a group of, of, of allies around it, but suddenly wants others to be um, in um, disunity or not coalescing in alliances. So you see it's, it's kind of a black and white vision. Uh, instead of wanting uh, a, a group around China that they can call allies, they would be satisfied with having other countries being dispersed and not united against China. Um, so this is also where this asymmetry is very important because if China is the preponderant, the, the biggest power and manages to um, uh, dis, um, make sure that there's no cohesion um, in its counter uh, response, um, this is, this is a, a good outcome, I think, for, for China. Therefore, um, I think that plays more into the necessity for the rest of us to act as a group instead of being in dispersed order in order to rise to the challenge. Thank you very much, Nadesh. That's an uh, excellent answer. Uh, Timothy, my apologies. You've, you've, you've hit the end mark, but I will however, give you the first, uh, uh, the last, the first last word. So my, my panelists, we're now going to have your minute and a half, uh, minute and a half, and you will please um, just give some closing remarks. Um, I would ask that you, um, you say to the audience as much as you can about your topic in that minute and a half, which you want them to go home with, and it should be insightful <laughs> about where we are now in the world. So my apologies for setting you up with such a challenge, but I know you're worthy to it. Timothy, we will begin with you and then we will go back to Nadej and then we will finish with Kanahara-san. So Timothy, minute and a half in terms of economic uh, regrowth after COVID. Well, you know, in the first place there is no, as I began my remarks, there's no after COVID. We're going to have to deal with this for forever. And uh, I hope there's an after COVID, but let's, I think we have to assume not. Um, the, the importance I think is that, uh, you know, the, this has been a very different, a very different recession, a very different situation than a lot of the, the recoveries that we've had to deal with in the past. There's a lot of savings, US, there's a high US savings rate right now and high savings rate, I think around the world. We have resources to move forward. It is all going to be about international cooperation, and that gets us to our other two speakers on this panel, finding ways to cooperate, finding ways to cooperate within ASEAN, within the broader region, and then with China to build up the economy, and then to deal with the issues of strategic competition that um, have been so ably discussed. And so that's my, uh, my short remark. Thanks very much, John. Thanks to the other panelists. Thank you, Tim. Nadesh. Uh, very briefly, I think uh, maybe one thing to keep in mind is that this U.S.-China competition, um, again, doesn't play just among those two powers. That all of us, uh, I'm French, so as a European, I think all of us have a role to play in making sure that um, uh, China's vision, which seems to be a juggernaut and uh, want to have a irreversible outcome, you know, of China being the preponderant power, there's nothing irreversible or, or ineluctable about that. Um, as long as we uh, make the right choices, right decisions, um, and have a say also uh, in, in, in the future. So that's, that's my concluding word. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So you're, you're, you have the final word. Oh, thank you very much. This is a very, very good s seminar. Thank you, Tim. Merci, Nadege. Je parle français. France has Nouvelle Caledonia. France is very important in the Pacific. Uh, I have to say that the, we, we should not fear too much Chinese rice because the, th this happens with the industrialization. Next one is India. And China has a huge problem now. The wealth gap is huge. Population is now aiding. And local governments, local enterprises are hugely in debt. And they can't fix it simply because when they fix it, they have to disorganize dis again this huge wealth at the top of the government party 
and then they can't fix it. That means they're going, to, they're going to slow down slowly. They are not vibrant industrial democracy. And meantime, we can shape their behavior. It's not depend upon their goodwill. It's we have to show them the course and we have to be united to try to persuade them, but from the position of strength. Otherwise, they don't listen to us. And this is very important and we can do it. Japan, Germany challenged and then joins the liberal order. And China will do that again. I think that the, uh, India is a born democracy. China was not. It's Mao's creation, India's Gandhi's creation. But we needed China to face Stalin Brezhnev. Now China is leaving us. Our message should be, stay with us. But we can't, we can't beg them. We have to pull them in again together. Thank you. I'd like to say thank you to all three of our wonderful panelists, Kanehara Nabukatsu, Nadej Olan, and Timothy Buer. Thank you very much for your insightful remarks about the current situation in the Indo-Pacific. I will now turn over to uh, uh, Professor Kunz, who will be taking us into the foresight session. Thank you. I will ask our panelists to turn off their camera and their mics. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, aloha. Um, I'm very excited to introduce uh, our next panel. Um, each of the panelists are actually have affiliation to APCSS. We have two alumni and one participant in several of our workshops. Um, they are beloved all here in Hawaii with strong ties to the region. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, the current deputy commander at U.S. Indo-Pacific Command who has had uh, previous command uh, positions at headquarters and prior to becoming the deputy commander was the chief of staff for the UN Command US Forces Korea. Um, he is a favorite with our alumni and is very good with uh, discussions with our alumni and really, really just embracing all of those values we talk about, about transparency, mutual respect and inclusion. Um, our second speaker will be, uh, he's going to speak to how do we deal with collaboration and um, in this era of strategic competition. So going forward, how do we continue to work together? There's many nations in this region. It's not just about the most powerful by traditional power and, and how do we work together and move forward together. Um, Ambassador Ellis uh, was the New Zealand head of mission and ambassador to the United Nations between 2013 and 16. Uh, she's been a force of nature in the development and, and the holding, holding lead positions in um, international development for the government in New Zealand as a deputy secretary, the head of New Zealand aid and New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. She currently serves as the director of strategic partnerships for the Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation at Arizona State University, which is perfect for the discussion that we're having. She's very involved in the UN discussions going forward, sustainable development goals. So we couldn't find a better speaker for some of the topics that we'll be discussing. And another beloved Navy Admiral that was here in Hawaii and retired in 2018 as the Pacific Fleet Commander. Um, I think everybody knows uh, Admiral Scott Swift, uh, he's the founder of the Swift Group. He has uh, academic affiliations across the board with some very impressive places like MIT, the Center for International Studies, as well as uh, the Center for Naval Analysis and Naval War College and Naval Institute. And we are very fortunate to have all of them here. Uh, Ambassador Ellis will speak to multilateral organizations in the future of that. Interestingly enough, our alumni felt 50% felt that the UN would not be as powerful, would be less powerful in the next 25 years. And many of the security issues that you've identified are not uh, included in our traditional military war fighting power. Uh, we're looking at issues of uh, um, environmental degradation, environmental security issues, resource scarcity. So what does that mean about how we have to evolve and we're fast Ambassador Swift, I mean, Admiral Swift to speak to these issues. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Lieutenant General Mike Minahan, the Deputy Commander of U.S. Indo-PACOM. Thank you, sir. Beth, I feel like I owe you money uh, for that introduction. Thank you very much. Um, first to the whole team out there, aloha, warmest aloha uh, from Indo-Pacific Command Headquarters. 
I hope that you and your families and your teams are all healthy in this challenging environment. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's truly an honor to be here. Uh, kia ora, Ambassador Ellis uh, and, and, and Aloha, Admiral Scott, sir. It's good to, be, uh, good to be with you again. And even virtually, uh, I know that your, your heart is, is always here in, in Hawaii. To Pete and the APCSS team, I'm rocking my, my lanyard uh, as a symbol of the investment that you made in me uh, many years ago. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. Uh, every day, and and the only thing I'd like to add to the end, in addition to the cool photo we're going to do, is perhaps we we all send a sing a happy birthday. Uh, 25 years, incredible years. Thank you for that. I think APCSS has established uh, lasting relationships across the you know the dozens and dozens of nations to advance uh, the interest, and we're incredibly grateful. Your specific reaction, as I've told you and your team many times, uh, in reacting to the COVID challenges, has been exceptional. And this, this event, this virtual venue has the warmth um, and feel of an in-person event. I know we want to get back to the in-person ones, but I feel that you all are really set the standard for what it means to, uh, to engage virtually in this challenging environment. Uh, you know, the, the relationships are incredibly important. And Indo-PACOM believes that our partnerships are critical. And when I say critical, I mean that the, the success of the region, the success of all our countries, uh, is based on our relationships and our partnerships. And it not only is it critical, it's the backbone. They are foundational uh, to what we do. If we don't have partnerships, nothing else is possible. Uh, that's why you hear us say, uh, when we use the term free and open Indo-Pacific, when we say free, we mean both from the traditional sense of security, uh, free from coercion, uh, you know, freedom by uh, exploitation of other nations, but also in terms of values and political systems. And when we mean open, we mean that all nations enjoy uh, unfettered open access to the seas and the airways, the global commons, if you will, uh, so that our economies and our people can thrive. It's how the U.S. has approached the Indo-Pacific in our 70, uh, uh, 70 plus year history, well, way more than that. And despite the many cultural differences that we have, we have incredible common set of values, um, incredible common set of interests, and, and, and in addition to the mutual security concerns that we all have. Values of the free and open Indo-Pacific are more critical today as we learn through, as we operating under the, the effects of COVID uh, that our first panel discussed very well. And these will, also, this will add to the already increasing challenges uh, to the established rules-based order. As many nations are forced to divert substantial resources because of COVID-19 risk mitigation and planning efforts, and the economies in the region are struggling, an emboldened Communist Party of China seeks to exploit the global commons, seeks to exploit the global pandemic crisis with increased aggression and malign behavior to their benefit. China's pernicious approach to the region includes a whole of party effort to coerce, corrupt, and contest the values that I talked about earlier, the ones that we all embrace for a free and open Indo-Pacific. The very values that like-minded nations across the globe seek to be a part of, uh, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, India, UK, France, Canada, ASEAN, as discussed earlier by the, by the first panel, all put these visions into place and the, the Japan Defense White Paper, the Australian Defense Security Strategy of 2020 are great examples of, of hard documents that we can all rally around to move forward. So these shared frameworks are important to us and are, and are the cornerstone of, of our alliance and partnerships. So I'd, I'd, I want to depart from my, my, my script real quick here and just say I, I found the, the panel one fascinating. And uh, Professor Brewer with the new normal, you couldn't have been it more. We're not going back to the old normal. We're going forward to a new, new normal. Uh, to Miss Roland, I thought that, that you were spot on in, in the words that you use, reshape, alter, exploit, subvert, um, and entitled when it comes to describes the Chinese Communist Party. And then, sir, Kar 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 um, your insights into the internal and external challenges that we all have, I think speak to not only the global security interests we have, but the nuanced ones too. Uh, an example would be um, economic independence, environmental concerns and security, fisheries, illegal uh, activities, maritime domain awareness. So I look forward uh, to the question and answer part. 
And uh, thank you very much for allowing me to join this panel. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Bottom line up front. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to pass the microphone over to uh, Ambassador Amanda Ellis. And, and uh, Amanda, we've asked you to speak to, um, and it is, a, it is a concern, my background and, and the work that I've done, it is a concern that uh, in the survey uh, that we put out that 50% felt that the UN uh, was going to be less powerful in the next 25 years, particularly given um, the non-traditional security issues. Many of the things that people see as the most pressing issues is something that the UN has been working for for the last 75 years or so. And, and many of these common values that we talk about is, is, is what is the, the foundation for many of the UN agency program and fund. We are so glad to have you here today. If you can talk about going forward, what does inclusive security look like? And what is the future of multilateralism? And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kunz. And I think if we didn't have a UN, we would have to invent it, even though it is far from perfect. So it's an honor to be in such distinguished company. Inga mana, inga reo, inga rangitiratanga, tēnā koutou, katoa. So greetings in Māori from Aotearoa, New Zealand. This formal greeting honors the mana, the leadership of our APCSS alumni right across the region, and the importance of shaping conversation, te reo, to help keep our region safe and secure, peaceful and prosperous. Those conversations are so important, as are the values that Dr. Gumatatao underlined. I want to preface my remarks by emphasizing they reflect my own personal views. And of course, we know we're at a critical juncture in history, in the grip of the pandemic, a global economic crisis, which is fast becoming a humanitarian crisis, intensifying extreme weather events and environmental security concerns, which ranked number one of our alumni for this foresight panel. The highest number of refugees since World War II and a range of strategic and security challenges on the horizon. So as the Secretary General at the UN said in his speech to the 75th General Assembly last week, in an interconnected world, solidarity is self-interest. So I wanna focus on three main issues as we look with foresight to the next quarter century. First of all, the role of the UN and our multilateral world order in inclusive security, including bringing new issues to the table like women, peace and security, where the US has been such a leader and climate change where islands have really led the way. Second, the challenges that are foreshadowed by the coronavirus pandemic and the linked looming threat of environmental insecurity that we really need to address now. And finally, UN outreach beyond member states and the roles that we as alumni can play to actively shape our future in the region. So 2020 commemorates the 75th anniversary of the UN. And the, the Secretary General has actually launched a global interactive listening tour way beyond member states to help build better global governance. We all know the UN Charter established the three founding pillars of the UN system, peace and security, human rights, and development based on an open, inclusive, and rules-based international order and a commitment to universal values, as Dr. Holland expressed so well. So 2015 actually marked a watershed for international and intergovernmental cooperation at the UN, notably with the Sendai Declaration on Disaster Risk Reduction, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Paris Climate Agreement. So the 17 SDGs provide an integrated framework. And what I think is really important for the first time in history, it is a globally agreed international development agenda with shared global goals. And that includes SDG 13 on climate, 16 on peace and justice, and 17, perhaps most importantly for our future, on multi-stakeholder partnerships. Now, as Dr. Kunz referenced, over half of our alumni I think the UN will be less relevant in the next 25 years. So let's take a look at the UN's most famous body, the Security Council. Many member countries are now questioning whether the current structure and MO of the Council are fit for purpose in a world that's very different from 20, 75 years ago. The relevance of the P5, the veto power are often questioned, but let's also consider the non-permanent members who rotate every two years and the role that they play 
in dialogue and in bringing critical new issues to the Council. And I want to hi highlight two that I think are particularly relevant. In 2000, the Council unanimously passed Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. And it was the first to recognize both the impact of violence on women and our important role as a positive force multiplier in peace and security. Now, it's worth remembering that in 2020, not a single country in the world has yet achieved full gender equality. And in only eight countries in the world, apart from Canada, all of them are outside our region, even have gender equality enshrined in legislation. And this is despite the fact that all of the data shows us that peacekeeping and conflict resolution is so much more effective with an inclusive approach. But the good news, some 86 countries now have national action plans. And APCSS and Indopaycom have been real leaders on this issue, so I want to give you both a shout out. Second, last year for the first time in history, the UN World Meteorological Organization was invited to brief the Security Council on Climate Change. And the chief scientist referenced the multitude of security impacts, rolling back the gains in nutrition and access to food, heightening the risk of wildfires and exacerbating air quality challenges, increasing the potential for water conflict, and leading to more internal displacement and migration. Now, frighteningly, the International Organization for Migration predicts there could be more than 200 million climate refugees in the next quarter century. Now, having visited refugee camps in my capacity as co-chair for the UN Security Council on humanitarian access into Syria, while New Zealand was on the council, I can attest firsthand not only to the devastating impact on those displaced, but also the significant impact on those countries hosting. Now, while the Security Council and the General Assembly are best known, the UN system has some 28 specialized agencies and a number of other adjunct bodies. And I think many of them play an important role in a rules-based order and that they will need to continue to play that role going forward. For example, the International Telecommunications Union, especially at the moment when digital issues are front and center, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, really important. They provide critical data, global coordination, and standard setting. Now, others like UNDP and the World Bank provide technical assistance for sustainable development, and we know that that underpins inclusive security. Extreme world poverty was halved by 2010, and mostly as a result of progress in our own region, in India and in China. But we also know the current global pandemic threatens to undo much of the progress made to date. And COVID-19 has really thrown into stark relief two concepts that I firmly believe must guide our foresight. The first is interdependence, as Dr. Bureau raised. And as the Secretary General points out, none of us is safe until we are all safe. And the second, exponentiality. It took 100 days to reach the first 1 million cases of COVID-19. Now it's about two days. The global tally is over 33 million cases and over 1 million deaths. Now, the same precept of exponentiality is true for the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere since the 1980s. And one scientist has called COVID-19 a mere fire drill for climate change. And while both exacerbate inequalities with implications for justice and inclusive security, as we enter the UN Decade for Action, renowned oceanographer Sylvia Earle warns the next 10 years are the most important for the 10,000, the next 10,000. And our APCSS alumni got this straight out of the gate. Alumni have identified climate change as the number one challenge in our region. And yet, if we look at the system of global governance right now, with the voluntary, nationally determined commitments on emissions, scientists are warning that we have a 97% chance of tipping over two degrees warming. I'm a very boring economist by training, so I really love the numbers. But it is, for me, frightening that climate scientists are pointing out the last time our planet saw two degrees global warming, sea levels rose six to eight meters. That's over 25 feet. So many are calling for the need to step up global governance and eliminate fossil fuel subsidies, which are estimated by the IMF at over five trillion a year. So to finish, the good news is we have solutions, including nature-based, clean tech, and carbon drawdown, but we need to ramp them up fast. Now, the UN is actively engaging local government and private sector players to shape positive trajectories. And here in Hawaii, the first local 2030 hub for islands has been named. And this morning I was moderating a global event with the Undersecretary General for the Small Island States, which of course are the most impacted. 
And it's interesting to know that since Hawaii recommitted to the Paris Accords, 23 other states have followed suit. And since it committed to 100% renewable energy, first state in the nation, 100 million Americans covered by local agreements have followed suit. So finally, the private sector is stepping up too, with the shift from shareholder to stakeholder focus, net zero and science-based targets. And now data is collected on some 60% of global market cap companies. Investors with over $115 trillion in assets are requesting information on climate change from the Carbon Disclosure Project. It is a material concern. So the UN Global Compact now has over 12,000 private sector members. The good news is that these technological advances mean renewable energy is now cheaper than fossil fuels. Sustainable and regenerative futures for our region are actually the pathway to future security and stability, peace and prosperity. And we can all make that a reality. I'm gonna save my call to action for the final wrap up and conclude with a message from our Secretary of the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Chris Seed, who's also an APCSS alum. He wants everyone to know that New Zealand remains big supporters, welcomes the connections with APCSS, values the perspectives it brings and the relationships it fosters across the Indo-Pacific. So thank you APCSS for the important role you play now for the next 25 years and beyond. Thank you so much, Amanda, for all the good work that you do um, and that tremendous amount of information that you packed into that short period of time. Um, Admiral Swift, I have asked you to be the, the, the visionary um, with your more than 40 years of service in the U.S. Navy and work in this region and your ties to a lot of the research uh, institutions. Um, We've asked you to look at the evolution of traditional security actors and institutions. You were the director of operations during Tomodachi and uh, at, up at Indopaycom, and you saw the complexity of the crises that we deal with and the fact that the militaries across the region are on the front dealing with this. So if I've, we've asked you to speak to how do we need to evolve to meet these thinking skills, these new skills that we'll need to adapt to and these new challenges that are not necessarily the traditional set of challenges we've been fighting against. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for that, Beth, and, and to uh, Minnie and Pete and all the others out there, such good friends. Uh, you know, my, my heart will always be in Hawaii, having been born in Queens Hospital, downtown Honolulu. So um, it's wonderful to participate virtually uh, although I wish I was there in person. Uh, congratulations to APCS for uh, the 25th uh, anniversary, and, and it's, uh, I think, particularly appropriate uh, uh, now more than ever that um, we need to expand our critical thinking around the world, especially in this challenging region that so many of us call home, and I think that's been reflected in all the comments that uh, we've heard from uh, all the panelists here this morning. Um, critical thinking and dialogue uh, where we can criticize ideas without criticizing individuals is extremely important. And I think that that's especially so uh, for a, from a foresight uh, perspective. Um, it's difficult to predict exactly what challenges we'll face uh, in the future, uh, although certainly there's plenty of challenges that we've identified already that will have a lasting impact on us and, and must be addressed more fully. I think it's more important to talk and think about the process by which uh, we should take these challenges on. So I think it's critical that we need to foster an environment of inclusion where, where diversity of uh, culture, race, gender, nationality, uh, and, and religion are viewed as strengths to be, embraces, to be embraced um, as a source of diverse ideas and as a rich source of solutions to the challenges uh, that we face um, within our own region and beyond. I think it's also important to note where there's instability, there's, there's opportunity to be drawn closer together. So we look at these challenges and you can't help but, but take a breath. Um, but I think we should look at these challenges as opportunities. And if we can find a way to do that, um, I think that there's uh, uh, much more uh, probability that we'll be able to address them in meaningful ways uh, much more quickly than we've been able to so far. 
the, the, what's most important is to address the sources of instability. It's been mentioned already, it, it's interesting to note that climate change, resource scarcity, and environmental degradation uh, were identified by the APSS uh, survey many of you uh, participated in as the most stressing security matters, pressing security matters that we face. I think it underscores once again the power and value of APCSS as a, as a broad organization. You identified the top three critical skills for security special professionals as critical thinking, cross-cultural communication, and interregional communication and understanding. Um, and that it was very important to understand uh, the, these, have this discussion to understand these non-traditional uh, security stress, uh, threats. My specialty has been in the field of defense, not security. But I am concerned that security has become a uniquely military domain. So when I think of, of my role in the military, I think that role is one that's focused on a responsibility and obligation in the case of the United States for me to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Security should be much more broadly held. Uh, that, that national security is a whole of government approach. It's a whole of region approach. And I think characterizing uh, these issues of climate change, uh, the other elements that you've identified have rightfully been identified as, as regional security issues. They're certainly national security issues. To underscore this point of the primacy of the role of the military, I point out General Mattis's approach to the challenges that he faced when he was Secretary of Defense uh, presented by uh, North Korea. And his approach was always to be deferential, to point out that it was Secretary Tillotson as Secretary of State who had to lead in determining how best to uh, uh, address this challenge that was brought not just to the United States, but to the region and in fact to the globe uh, by the North Korean actions. To me, this is one of the key attributes of APSS, to challenge what have become norms and consider alternative models. Security for security's sake has little to no value. Security to regain or sustain stability has incredible value for the simple reason that without stability, there cannot be prosperity. People will not make the investments necessary in order to sustain the trajectory of growth if there's not a sense of trust build, built from stability. Where the military is the lead agency, they naturally reach for military tools to apply to the challenges they are tasked with addressing. This is often problematic as they are often not a good fit. To limit this from occurring, governments need to think strategically, plan operationally, and act tactically. Too often, not just in, in governments, but um, with multiple organizations and in business as well, um, we tend to think, plan, and act tactically, and then we don't understand why we can't get out, of, out ahead of the problem set that we face. This is a core strength that APCSS brings to the region uh, through its educational and outreach programs. National defense is clearly a key responsibility of the military. National security is an inclusive responsibility of all the elements of national power and regional power that must be inclusive of other countries which share similar national security concerns. So I'll close on that point. I very much look forward to the questions that uh, are yet to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, those are Fantastic points about how we need to rewire uh, how we look at things uh, going forward. Um, I'd like to ask that uh, Amanda and uh, General uh, Minahan also uh, turn on their screen so we can start our Q&A period. Okay. Um, from our alumni, we have two questions. I'll start with the first. For issues like climate change, resource scarcity, and environmental degradation, what will inclusive and cooperative security look like? Um, in order of response, each of you uh, take pretty much as long as you want for this one. Uh, Amanda um, and Admiral Swift, 
and uh, Ambassador uh, Ellis, Admiral Swift, and uh, General Minahan in order, please. Thank you. Well, I think Admiral Swift really said it beautifully. National security is an inclusive responsibility. And it is this important process of making sure that we have a systems thinking approach. This is our world is a very complex interdependent place and making sure that we do approach it with systems thinking. I think too that it's really important to look at the different actors, not only with among countries, but also intra-country. Too often we would leave the climate negotiators, the ambassadors to do their thing without recognizing the impact that it had on, for example, uh, development or human rights. So this more inclusive approach, I think is absolutely key. And I think to, to have the linkages and incentives really drawn out. If we look at 2015, when we were all negotiating the Paris Accords, the IMF estimated $5.4 trillion in direct and indirect subsidies to fossil fuels in that same year. So clearly a very big disconnect. And I think there's a, a free rider problem right now with the global governance in which, with which we are trying to address climate change particularly. These voluntary nationally determined contributions are not going to get us to where we need to go to. So it is interesting for me to see this broader approach that the United Nations is now trying to take, including the private sector and including civil society and science into this broader approach. And in terms of local action, the example is, is really important when we look at aligning policy incentives. If we're not able to do that, it's challenging. But we need technology to be able to implement solutions. And then we need behaviors to change as well. So it is a very complex interrelated system. And uh, I think it absolutely needs to underpin our thinking going forward. Thank you. General Menahan, do you have any comments with this question? I do, thank you. Um, first of all, I thought the, the remarks by the others were, were very good and, and Ms. Ellis's remarks on this were, were, were spot on. You know, inclusive has many, many levels to it. So, um, you know, and I thought that uh, Admiral Swift nailed it when he talked about, you know, not, you know, the, the depth of security. So inclusive needs to make sure that um, that, that we and do, do include all like-minded nations. This gets at the heart of the free and open Indo-Pacific, that all have a voice, an equal voice, even though uh, what they say may have incredible nuance and difference, but, the, but we know that the values are the backbone of that. Um, so whether we're working through a bilateral treaty alliance, um, you know, with, a, with an actual treaty, or we're working through a quad, or we're working through ASEAN, or we're working through a Chiefs of Defense conference, conference, that those voices are heard and their equities are fair, fairly represented, which, which brings to the other inclusiveness that, you know, you and, and Admiral Swift hit this perfectly. You can't just look at this as, um, as, as defense, uh, much more depth there, uh, economics. Um, we definitely hit the environment. You know, we met with, I met with President Panuelo. Uh, last year on the heels of his address to the UN Gen General Assembly, and it was very clear um, that the environment was the number one security concern uh, for FSM. So I think that, uh, you know, those words I just want to emphasize uh, uh, greatly there. Inclusiveness also in, uh, needs to encompass all the instruments of national power that can come and help and that this doesn't always need to be a military solution to everything. So, you know, in the U.S., it's the, it's the commerce, it's the trade, it's the State Department, it's the Peace Corps. Um, you know, so much more depth than just the military aspect there, I think, needs to be in. And then the, the last layer I'll talk about is the partner and allies piece. And, and, and you, you brought this up in your op opening remarks, or at least in the first panel where we talked about, you know, Japan's lead with, uh, with their paper, is that partners and allies 
can can bring their strengths and their depth of nation and whole of government and interagency as well and sometimes proximity too right proximity matters as well and and expertise and knowledge of certain reasons uh to provide you know this uh this inclusivity so I, I, hopefully i got the got the question there answered right but i, I thought it was a good question and I, and I hopefully i just added a little depth to the others yes sir uh admiral swift Yes, I'll, I'll just add a little context to this and, and uh, just to footstop a couple of points. Um, there, is time, there are time to pursue bilateral solutions and there are time to pursue multilateral solutions. But when it comes to climate, because everyone is affected, re regardless of their perspective, a multilateral approach, I think, is, is critical, multilateralism. Um, to, to General Minahan's comments in, in a military parlance, we, we talk about who's the, the supported entity and who is the supporting entity. And that's useful for those of us in the military and government agencies that work with the military. I think too often times the military is put in the lead by policymakers without thinking of whether they are really the best one. They may have the most resources, but they may not have the best capability to solve the problem. So thinking in terms of who is supported and supporting is useful. Climate change, define the problem. We race to solutions. So let's define the problem. This is my military training kicking in here from a planning perspective as well. And when you define the problem, you have to approach it from a scientific perspective. It's the science determining what the problem is. You have to look at the facts. Once you've looked at the facts, and you can have an argument about what the facts are from those multilateral groups that are participating, then comes the hard work of developing the art of the solution. This is not a science-based process. This is what the, you know, the UN was designed for. This is what ASEAN was designed for. NATO was designed for in, in, uh, in many ways. It's pursuing the art of the solution. The other thing, the last comment I would make, the ambassador made a comment that triggered a thought in my mind is that we need standards of participation. And you know, the US is guilty of this as well, you know, paying for its fair share with the UN as an example. But I think standards of participation need to be clarified that if you're going to participate, these are the kind of contributions that need to be made. And it's based on the ability of whoever is participating. It doesn't have to be financial, um, it may be knowledge based, but I think those standards of participation are, are important to have a discussion up front so that there's a, a, a way to measure um, active participation as opposed to, you know, someone that is not pulling their full weight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, over the last hour and a half or so, we've heard uh, quite a bit about the requirements of cooperation across the board, um, broadening our, our concept of security. Uh, Admiral Swift, I like your, your comment about think strategically, plan operationally, and act tactically. We usually are stuck at what we talk about with the five meter target and we're doing whack-a-mole, um, particularly in the operational environment of COVID. Joseph Nye describes this, uh, the power distribution globally right now is a multidimensional chessboard. And we certainly feel that when we bring everybody in from the, all of the fellows, from all of the different walks of life and from all of the different aspects of government that are looking at security or addressing the same issue from very different lenses, we start understanding the complexity of the issues that we have to face. And we have an opportunity to think more strategically and look at these and maybe, maybe have a, a better plan when we go back. And uh, in our day to day, we kind of end up getting stuck in that five meter target Amanda, you're dealing with uh, a lot looking forward when you mentioned the climate refugees, several hundred million climate refugees were looking at risk. And the small island developing states are facing that risk. Um, and that's their five meter target. We have Jakarta is, is gonna be underwater. Bangkok is gonna be underwater. We have significant risk in the region that it, it affects differently for all of us. So when we come together and how we look at things, you're right, we, we need to factor all of these things in and our, and our alumni are certainly right in that critical thinking skills and systems analysis and all of these skills and inclusiveness and bringing everyone together and that it's that, uh, that uh, common, the linkage, um, the common linkage between all of us. 
Uh, so the next question for all of you in, in, in your contribution, and, I, I, and Sir uh, General Minahan, when you're talking about those common values that tie us all together and being accountable to them, that's a very important, that trust and that accountability to those common values and those common norms. That's an essential part of all of this. And that is also a big part of the discussion uh, with our alumni. The second question that I have for you involves risk. One of our alumni stated during the webinar we had to get feedback for this, uh, said that risk is not linear, but our response is linear. And this is something that has been a bit reiterated today. It must be systematic. Or uh, the thinking of current global pandemic uh, going forward, how can we regionally improve our understanding, our cooperation, and our response to risk based upon our experience thus far? Um, again, I'm going to do same order, Ambassador Ellis, uh, Admiral Swift, and then General uh, Minahan. Thank you. This is such a critical issue. And we come back to this systems thinking, a systemic approach. But I think there's also a new twist on what we used to call diversity and inclusion and is now being called inclusion and diversity, that we need to include all voices and then try to leverage the diversity within it. And I actually wanted to give a shout out to both uh, Lieutenant General Minahan and Admiral Swift because uh, Lieutenant General Varez Lum has told me just what champions you both are for inclusion and diversity and what a huge difference it makes. So I wanted to give you that shout out. And that for me is the real basis for being able to have a systemic approach. Then I agree fully, it has to be data driven and science informed. Then the, the notion of scenario planning is one that is becoming much more common these days. How is it that we actually blue sky and figure out a range of different solutions? And we know that in fact, scientists had been warning for the last 10 years that there was a 70% chance of a zoonotic pandemic. Uh, and there was even a wonderful film about it, Contagion, which looked pretty close to what actually happened in China. So how do we take that foresight and workshop it and build some redundancy into the system. The private sector is talking about that now. If your supply chains are too tight and you don't have any redundancy built in, you're at increased risk. So we really do need to be thinking about scenario planning and preparedness. And then Admiral Swift said it beautifully, the art of the solution. Thank you. General Minahan. Thank you. And, uh, first of all, I agree. Susie Barislum is an amazing lady and she leads me and babysits me every day and uh, I appreciate her passing on uh, that compliment. Um, when it comes to risk, you know, we, we saw very early in the COVID pandemic that, you know, this, this is not a, a, an environment that we can run away from. Um, so we knew immediately that despite imperfect information, imperfect data, imperfect tools on how to interpret those things, and let's be honest, pandemic is, is not uh, um, something we've had to deal with in a, in a great while. Um, and, and so that there was going to be risk, that we were going to have to figure out a way to operate in the environment and not in, avoid the COVID environment. So I thought very early, um, you know, so in order to learn about risk, you got to take risk. I mean, that's the bottom line. You can't avoid it. So if you're risk adverse, um, you know, this would frustrate you more and ham hamper, you, uh, hamper you more. If, if you understand that you've got to learn to mitigate the risk as best you can, that you're going to have to establish some mechanisms that, that learn uh, along the way and get fed back in to the risk models and the operational models that you're moving out on, um, then, then I think that, you, you know, that's, that's exactly where Indo-PACOM went along with all the partners and allies. Very early we went in and did Cobra Gold uh, with the Marine Corps in Thailand. There were partner nations in uh, Thailand alongside that. We had, uh, we had uh, port visits continue. We had co-deployments continue. Uh, 
RIMPAC modified is a great example of risk mitigation. The ties coming to train on the big island in here uh, on Hawaii, great examples of mitigation. Um, forces in Japan and Korea continuing their operational tasks, working with, the, with those two governments and militaries to, to mitigate the risk within the structures of those countries. Incredible uh, comments on risk mitigation and not complete risk avoidance. So I agree with the outcome. Um, I think that, or I, I agree with the comment on, on linear and nonlinear. I think that the, you know, the big thing we did in conjunction with our partners and allies was learn how to best mitigate the risk, have those open dialogues so that we could feed in the adjustments as we went along. And certainly today uh, with RIMPAC is a great example. Uh, we learned to operate and survive within the environment that it is. Over. Thank you, sir. Admiral Swift. Yeah, thanks, Beth. Uh, so I, this, um, it's difficult to describe this point in the context of COVID, uh, but, and, and this is, uh, uh, parallels the uh, General Minahan's comments on risk. So I spent a lot of time talking about embracing risk as a resource. And my personal view, I, I, I think that um, as, as a general rule, the military tends to be too risk adverse just from you know, our recent experiences. And, and unfortunately, I think the, the leadership of, of General Davidson is, or Admiral Davidson is somewhat unique in the recognition that, that we do have to uh, take risk when we're um, focused on sustained stability in, in the uh, Indo-Pacific. Um, but I'll use the example is that it's what risk is acceptable to you. And if you look at, at countries who have been slow to respond to COVID, in, uh, intended or otherwise, their tolerance of risk was much higher than the, the reality of, of uh, what the, de the uh, disease was able to impose. Now, recognizing we don't, didn't know then what we know now, but as we learn, we have to constantly reassess our willingness to accept risk. So now we're, you know, we're throwing tactical solutions, more masks and tests and other, thing at the pro other things at the problem set rather than looking at the trajectory and where we could end up. You know, we're over a million deaths now, and you know, I've, I've seen some statistical analysis that suggests we'll, we'll cross the two million threshold within a matter of a few months, just based on the, the, the logarithmic uh, uh, growth of, of uh, you know, the spread of the disease and the impact of it. So I think understanding risk is, is very important. It's not just about uh, driving it down to zero. It's recognizing that, that, that there's, we only have so much control over risk. So what is the best approach to be taken with managing it? Uh, I'm back to climate change again. The, the controls that we have for controlling co climate change are measured in years. And yet we're, the impacts that, that we're seeing are generated from uh, things that occurred decades ago. So we are living, we are without accepting that the risk that we're living with now, there is no way we can manage the risk on the future generations that they're going to have to live with. You know, this is the, the foresight piece. I can't predict what the future is going to be, but the predictive analysis tells us this is the approach that we need to take to managing this world that we live in today, whether you're talking about climate, whether you're talking about uh, national defense issues or national security issues, um, governance issues, whatever it, uh, whatever it may be. I think this element of risk, um, there needs to be a much broader discussion of uh, how we can manage it. You can't just throw money at a problem and, and suggest that you're going to be able to drive uh, risk down. That's not the way COVID behaves, and that's not the way the climate behaves. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, we're slightly over. Um, if I can give each of you a um, short moment to give your concluding thoughts. Um, I will start with General Minahan. <laughs> awesome. Hey, and then go to Amanda and Admiral Sip. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I am so grateful for the journey uh, in this region, uh, which is almost 10 years of my career. 
two tours in Korea with the United Nations Command, all the sending states, a wonderful partner ally that included the, the UN bases in the rear in Japan, uh, part of a, a multinational command center uh, in, in the Philippines, led by the Philippine Armed Forces for the response to Typhoon Yolanda, my time in Utapau, Thailand, in a multinational command center in response to the Nepal earthquake, the LNOs that grace the presence of this headquarters each and every day, and then all the wonderful interactions from Chad to RIMPAC to Quad to India. I mean, every, the, you know, the Pacific Island Forum, uh, the COFA, you just name it. It's, I'm grateful for the journey. I'm better for it. Um, and, and we as a, a nation are better for it. Free and open Indo-Pacific requires extreme alignment of partners and allies. It starts with events like this, and we see the, we see the, the good outcomes of it each and every day. So thank you. Ambassador. As an alum, I couldn't agree more, and I think the values of transparency, mutual respect, and inclusion are absolutely key. I'm going to have some really practical calls to action for our alumni based on the fact that they identified environmental security as the biggest challenge. So even though COP26 is postponed to next year because of COVID, the Paris Accord national commitments are still due by the end of this year. And I want to challenge all our alumni to use their influence to ensure that the security sector has a voice and that the targets are ambitious and that you continue to call out fossil fuel subsidies. Second, we know that inclusive security is more effective and congratulations Indonesia and others in the chat who've been telling me about their women peace and security national action plans. So please make sure you have a plan, it's resourced and being put into action. And like General Minahan and Admiral Swift, be a personal ally, mentor and sponsor. And finally, as individuals, engage in the UN 75th anniversary initiative listening tour to contribute your views to shaping the future we want, the UN we need, and either I or Dr. Kuntz can help with that. Thanks for a fantastic discussion. Thank you, Ambassador. Admiral Swift? So I'll, I'll be quick here. Uh, I got a little nervous when the Ambassador talked about her call to action because that's what my, my message to all of those listening, if, if you are a skeptic, as you're listening to all six panelists and, and the moderators, um, you're looking at it skeptically, think in the context of how big the challenges that we face and what we're suggesting a way forward might be. So, so I want to start with uh, talking about uh, being exclusive. We all know what other people are when they're exclusive. They say things like, because I said so. I know more than you do. I have more education. Uh, I have more power, whatever it may be. Inclusive leaders say things like, what do you think? I don't know. Have you seen this problem before? And invariably when I'm talking about leadership, someone or a number of people come up to me afterwards and say, I live in an exclusive environment. How, how can I bring inclusivity to the environment that I live with? And my message to them and my message to you is it starts with you. Start acting on these issues that are important to you now. Small steps are okay. If everyone takes one small step forward, the, the region will leap forward as a result. The initial measurements may be very small, but in an inclusive way, they, they will uh, build to the point to where real change is occurring. I uh, appreciate the panelists and the great insights. Um, I've got so much more out of this than uh, what I've contributed for sure. And uh, Beth, thanks so much for uh, being such a great uh, coordinator and moderator. Thank you all so much. It was an absolute honor to get to put this together and you've truly challenged all of us. And I can't thank you enough. You are extraordinary, all of you. And I'd like to pass you off, uh, pass off to my director, who I'm running a little bit late because of me. So, sir, it is it is your time to close out. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, as they always say in the Naval Academy, time, tide, and formation waits for no one. Beth, I think you know that. Hey, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm the wrap up batter here, the cleanup batter, but. Uh, I have to say though, uh, I have a couple of slides, but, but if you all can bear with me for a moment. 
Re really, the six panelists, you, you hit it out of the park. Uh, I'll tell you how I feel right now. I, I feel right. If you say, how do you feel from those remarks? I mean, you know, not so took my, uh, my thoughts on this, but I really, I was motivated just listening to them. I was inspired, but most importantly, I was empowered, you know, and, and empowered to do what? Not just to do critical thinking and all of this, but empowered to collectively act together. I just mentioned earlier about we've got an incredible team. Many of the panelists went back and talked about the alumni and how they understand TMI, transparency, mutual respect and inclusion, and taking that to the next level. I have to say uh, on my observations of the two panels and thank the two moderators to cyber, uh, call sign cyber, but it's, it's uh, Dr. John Hemmings and also Ben, Dr. Beth, Beth Kutz Wagner. In the first, in the first uh, discussions, really what stood out with me uh, was about, hey, helping shape behavior, but in a position of strength collectively. And then the other thing that stood out with me in the first session is that, you know, it's, it's, not, about, <clears throat> it's not about China and the US. Everyone has a role to play. And so, uh, and so we need to be able to, because you know, China's gonna be there in the 21st century. We need to all work together and you can't exclude them. But I really like the discussion in the insight about, you know, hey, anchor on the common overlapping points. And, and I will tell you from out there in the region, the thing that resonates, these values, the stuff that, that Minnie talked about in the second panel, and, and, and every one of you actually touched on it. You know, the liberal order, the thing about what makes uh, the need for a free market, the values of sovereignty, individual liberty. So I got that in the first panel. And then the second panel, my God, there's too many things. But the one I would say that stuck out the most and that, it, that, that with me is that national security is an inclusive responsibility. That came from, uh, that came from not so. But I'll tell you, not so, I'll add that. Economic prosperity is tied to national security. So it's all a closed loop system I really love the fact you guys talked about risk. And when we, if you look back in my opening comments about uh, hindsight, I talked about opportunities. You know, I gave a, a presentation on risk management to a previous course here at, in APCSS and, and start with a threat, but then with the threat, people have to balance risk and opportunities. Once you mitigate the risk, the folks that understand that risk is always going to be with us, no matter what, it's never going to be a perfect world. And I think the second group talked about, hey, it's not just about China or strategic competition. It's, there are many emerging challenges out there, but there are many opportunities. And you can only get to opportunities if you mitigate the risk, open yourself for collaboration. Woo! Look, there's a lot more takeaways on that, but I know... Uh, Beth is, is giving me the hook since she gave me minus five already. <laughs> Can we go to the next slide, please? I just wanted to, Beth, are you up? Can you hear me still? Yeah, can you bring, bring up the next slide? Okay, this is a really, really important slide. You know, I was always taught growing up in the Navy, you know, is you thank folks when it matters. I, I've talked about the panelists and the, and the moderators. Thank you so much. You know, the, the lead in this, uh, of course, was, uh, was Beth, but you also have Sherry Lynn on the other side from the Rio. That's represented here. You also have the folks from the PA side, the virtual side. You got the front office. Hey, you saw Jim Harai right there in the center, the dean, the ISD folks that we had no interruption in the virtual world here. Uh, and and the alumni folks and the and the admissions folks that you're going to be seeing soon. Thanks to everyone. You know, I gave a shout out to Lenore being a plank owner, but she's behind the scenes navigating quarterbacking. Uh, so to everybody that's up on the screen and then some, thank you so much for being part of this awesome final webinar series that we have. Great, but the best is yet to come. Here we go. Can you get to the next slide? Oh yeah, yes. Hey, Minnie, thank you for that suggestion of uh, coming up with uh, a birthday song. We did, we, we did an audible in, a, in another separate chat and I said, hey, Minnie's got a good idea there. But look, this 
group right here collectively is what's going to get us to a, a prosperous and a free and a stable uh, Indo-Pacific region for the 21st century. It's our alumni base that understand that in order to build understanding and relationships to get to tangible outcomes, we need to, we need to have a safe space to have these discussions and to have leadership out in the region working with like-minded allies and partners along with the United States to be able to get us to a more prosperous, even better uh, region than we already realize. So thank you to all of the alumni. I encourage the alumni that's up in the net, you all know that we have the security nexus online. And I ask you, uh, it's a peer review. If you wanna publish something in your alumni, utilize the security nexus in sharing and educating and connecting with others uh, some of the thoughts and challenges that we have, but more importantly, opportunities in the future. And lastly, before I get off the stage and, and hand this off to Tom Patakula, world famous Tom Patakula, we do have a, in the end of this session, a nine minute uh, video made by our alumni to wish us well. And so in my last, uh, my last closeout act, oops, I got one more slide. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Lenore. We have a book. So to cap out these series of events of webinar, our team came together with faculty past and present to give you uh, um, some key points and their perspectives on the, the region from a hindsight insight perspective. It will be posted on our website here this week and there's the link to it, you'll have that. And also I saw a comment on the, on the chat whether or not the, the remarks and stuff uh, are available to you that are made by our panelists. We didn't make this a non-attribution event. So this is an open discussion and we're also recording it. You'll see the recording later on, but if you can reach back to Beth or whoever, for any of us to get the remarks from our panelists, I'm sure they'll be very happy to share it. Okay, 